A reading from the letter to the Hebrews. Every priest stands daily at his ministry, offering frequently those same sacrifices that can never take away sins. But this one offered one sacrifice for sins and took his seat forever at the right hand of God. Now he waits until his enemies are made his footstool. For by one offering he has made perfect forever those who are being consecrated. The Holy Spirit also testifies to us for after saying, this is the covenant I will establish with them. After those days, says the Lord, I will put my laws in their hearts and I will write them upon their minds. He also says, their sins and their evil doing I will remember no more. Where there is forgiveness of these, there is no longer offering for sin. Verum Domini. You are a priest forever in the line of Melchizedek. You are a priest forever in the line of Melchizedek. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand, I will take your enemies, I will make your enemies your footstool. You are a priest forever in the line of Melchizedek. The scepter of your power the Lord will stretch forth from Zion, rule in the midst of your enemies. You are a priest forever. Yours is princely power in the day of your birth, in holy splendor. Before the day star, like the dew, I have begotten you. You are a priest forever in the land of Jesus. The Lord has sworn, and he will not repent. You are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. You are a priest forever in the land of Jesus. Sancti Evangelii secundum Marcum. Gloria Tibi On another occasion, Jesus began to teach by the sea. A very large crowd gathered around him, so that he got into a boat on the sea and sat down. And the whole crowd was beside the sea on the land. And he taught them at length in parables. And in the course of his instruction, he said to them, Hear this, a sower went out to sow. And as he sowed, some seed fell on the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Other seed fell on rocky ground where it had little soil. It sprang up at once because the soil was not deep. And when the sun rose, it was scorched and withered for lack of roots. Some seed fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it, and it produced no grain. And some seed fell on rich soil and produced fruit. It came up and grew and yielded thirty, sixty, and a hundredfold. 
he added, whoever has ears to hear, all to hear. And when he was alone, those present along with the twelve questioned him about the parables. He answered them, the mystery of the kingdom of God has been granted to you, but to those outside everything comes in parables, so that they may look and see, but not perceive, and hear and listen, but not understand, in order that they may not be converted and be forgiven. Jesus said to them, Do you not understand this parable? Then how will you understand any of the parables? The sower sows the word. These are the ones on the path where the word is sown. As soon as they hear, Satan comes at once and takes away the word sown in them. And these are the ones sown on rocky ground who when they hear the word receive it at once with joy, but they have no roots. They last only for a time. Then when tribulation or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. Those sown among thorns are another sort. They are the people who hear the word, but worldly anxiety, the lure of riches, and the craving for other things intrude and choke the word, and it bears no fruit. But those sown on rich soil are the ones who hear the word and accept it, and bear thirty and sixty and a hundredfold. Verbum Domini Today we hear the parable of the seed and the sower, and we see that the seed has quite an imperiled journey, right? There's many threats and dangers to it. It can fall on the footpath, it can fall on rocky ground, it can fall amidst the thorns, or maybe, just maybe, it reaches the rich uh, soil. We see that Jesus describes the ones falling on the footpath as the ones where Satan steals the seed. Remember, he is the head of the fallen angels. He's a real personal being with his minions that we're told in the book of Revelation that a third of the angels fell with him. He is Lucifer Lightberry. He was the greatest of the angels, and St. Michael battled him and cast him out of heaven. <clears throat> his theme is... Uh, non-servium, right? He won't serve God. He'd rather rule in hell. And he made a choice, right? He chose to be against God. And this is a terrifying ability that we all have. He is a personal being. He's angelic, personal being. And modernity has a big problem with that, right? We don't like to have this, we don't like to believe in this personal being that's totally committed to evil, right? We Modernity, modernity dismisses it as some kind of fairy tale. And I think part of the reason is, you know, the reminder of evil, the possibilities, the consequences of evil. <clears throat> and, and we don't like to think that way, right? We don't like to think in terms of conversion and giving our life over to the Lord and serving him. But Satan is real. He's a threat to us. And he's definitely the smartest guy in the room, right? He's much smarter than we. He's more clever than we are. He's more powerful than we are. He can influence us. We like to think that I'm doing all right, right? We forget about holiness, loving God as being the driving force of our lives, that we are to imitate and have communion with Jesus. Basically, don't ask me to change, right? That's our modern uh, theme or, or slogan. So that's pretty bad, but then there's also rocky ground. Those who first receive this word with joy, but the seed has no roots. There's not enough soil to put down roots, so it's short-lived. This joy is short-lived, and when tribulations and persecutions come, 
right? The seed fails, right? It withers and dies. Or there's the seed that falls amongst the thorns. And Jesus describes this as worldly anxieties, the lure of riches, cravings for other things, right? Covetousness, right? We desire other things. We put that over the kingdom and its values. And I think in both these last two, with rocky ground and the thorns, I think oftentimes at the heart of it is we really don't want to die to ourselves, right? We can celebrate the gospel, we can see the goodness of Jesus and his teachings and everything, but there's a call in being a disciple, right, to follow our Lord, to pick up our cross, right, to die to ourselves. And the old Adam doesn't go away easy, right? The old Adam within us, our self-centeredness, our pride, uh, doesn't want to die. You know, we want to place our wants, our needs, uh, being in control, you know, first. You know, instead of a life, a gospel life of self-giving, of spending ourselves, serving others, imitating the crucified one, that seems like another level, doesn't it? We have faith and belief in Christ, accepting what the church teaches, and then really living that out and giving of ourselves, dying to ourselves, instead of you know, going after the things of the world and exalting ourselves. St. Hyacinth, who described in the Office of Readings today as a Franciscan uh, Third Order saint, and she I did not, we're told, did not develop the virtues of religious life until she had a serious illness, right? And then she had this uh, deeper conversion, right? When these things were taken away from her, right? She embraced our Lord in a deeper way. But the good news is, is that there is rich soil, we're told, that the seed, when it finds that rich soil, it bears 30, 60, and 100 fold an incredible yield, an incredible harvest. And that's the way the gospel is in our lives, right? It has this mysterious fruitfulness. If we have faith and believe Jesus, cling to him, seek to do his will, he draws this incredible fruitfulness that we could not produce of our own. If you hang out at the friary here, you'll see Father Joseph with his wheelbarrow and shovel. He's going to the back, getting the garden ready for the coming planting season. And we give him a lot of grief. I give him a lot of grief and tease him about it. He's working in the compost. He's putting in fertilizer and trying to prepare the soil, right? He's working now in preparation for planting. He wants to make that soil rich to receive the seed. And we have to work at it, right? We have to have a life of prayer, we have to lead a sacramental life, we have to perform works of charity, we have to live a life of fidelity to our state and life. That produces that rich soil, right, that, that, that yields a great harvest. Well, Benedict says that the seed seems like a small thing compared with the field of the world, compared with the historical and political realities of the day. It seems almost negligible, right? We could miss the seed. And we know Jesus performed healings and exorcisms and miracles during his, his three years, only three years of public ministry. He came from Nazareth, a small little town, and he did these things in Jerusalem and throughout Israel, which was not a powerful nation of any great significance, right? Seemingly, you could miss you know, if you're in the world, you'd miss the entire ministry of what he did. But Benedict goes on to say, the word of God seems only a word, almost nothing. But take courage. This word contains life, it bears fruit. That the kingdom is present in mystery now. It's underway, right? Jesus tells us it's at hand. And there's a coming consummation where you know, the world, the entire world's transformed and offered by our Lord, by Jesus to the Father. And he is at work today, right? He's radically changing minds and hearts. And he's leading people to renew the world according to gospel values. I can't help but be reminded of this at these different uh, marches and walks for life, right? I was at the San Francisco one. And to have a, a pro-life 
rally there in San Francisco, which is a symbol, you know, in America of a, of a secular world, and to have 50,000 people gather, and essentially what they're doing is proclaiming the gospel of life, proclaiming the dignity and sanctity of life in this modern city, right? Going down the main avenue in San Francisco and preaching life, and yes, there's opposition, there's counter demonstrators yelling things and trying to prevent this from happening, but that gospel's being proclaimed. And hopefully that seed is, is falling upon rich soil, right, to bear fruit, you know, to encourage other Christians and maybe to inspire others uh, to do something in the vineyard, right, for the gospel of life. This seed is small, but it has incredible power within it, that the world, the word, goes out and bears fruit in every age, in every time, and in every place. Just where you think there's no hope, or the place is too dark, or it's too irrelevant, you know, to the situation, God bears fruit there, right? He, he strikes someone's heart, that Holy Spirit convicts a heart to do something, right? And the saints are an eloquent witness of that in every time, right? In every place. We can't say our age is different, or it's too hopeless, or it's too remote from us. No, the seed bears fruit uh, in every time and place. The sower, and this is a, a point to remember that uh, Father Renero Cantola Mesa made this point and it struck me so deeply that the sower is sowing everywhere. He's just flinging that seed, right? He's not carefully measuring it out to only find and test the soil, find the best soil. He's not concerned where it lands. He lets the seed do the work, right? And we need to be the same, because the Holy Spirit convicts hearts, right? And we can't limit that. Our job is just to get the seed out there, just to fling that seed as we go. In the first reading today, we're told in the letter to the Hebrews about the one priesthood of Jesus Christ, that his offering is the one uh, sacrifice for sins that makes perfect, those who are being consecrated, those who are being sanctified. His sacrifice for us is to perfect, to sanctify, to make us holy. And that power of sanctification is made present to us today, 2,000 years later, in the sacraments, especially in the Eucharist, where his sacrifice on Calvary is represented for us and to us. His one sacrifice represented on the altars during the Eucharist. The power is present, that death and resurrection is presented to us in all the sacraments, but especially in the Eucharist, right? We can enter into that one sacrifice. And he is present to us and makes that power of, the of his sacrifice present to us through the ministry of the apostles and their successors. That the 12 are called by him, taught by him, that they have pastoral and priestly authority in the church, that Jesus to this day is present to the flock through their ministry. He tells them to go and baptize all nations, to proclaim the gospel. At the Last Supper, the Eucharist, he tells them, do this in memory of me. You know, in the upper room, he breathes the Holy Spirit upon them tells them, if you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. He tells them, he who hears you, hears me. He who receives you, receives me. He is present in them in a special way to do these works, right? To extend his priesthood, we could say, and, uh, and to be its ministers, right? To share in that his priesthood. So the ordained ministry shares in the one priesthood of Jesus Christ and the priesthood of the baptized. By virtue of your baptism, you share in the one priesthood of Jesus Christ. The church is careful to explain that the two, the ordained, the ministerial priesthood and the priesthood of the baptized are, there's a difference in kind. They're essentially different in that the, the ordained minister <clears throat> has a spiritual character imparted to him that configures him to Christ the head to serve in his person, to act in his name in a special way. And they are ordered to 
to serve the lay faithful, to sanctify uh, the priesthood of the baptized, and that the laity especially are ordered to sanctify the world. But both are called to sow, both in their own way, share in the one priest of, priesthood of Christ to sanctify the world. Both have a mission in proclaiming the gospel to sow that seed. Remember, we heard recently in our readings, uh, Jesus goes to Nazareth and says, you know, reads the scripture passage about the spirit of the Lord being upon him to go and proclaim this good news. And that spirit is upon all of us, right, to go and sow that seed through our words, through our actions and efforts and uh, service to the least. We all are part of that mission to fling and scatter that seed you know, throughout our lives, right, to help others to find Christ and to further the kingdom. 